Okay, so last presentation of the morning. I still hope you're still all awake. Those who are still here, hope you're doing well. So we have all this data, and as was asked in the first presentation, what do we do with it? Good question. So I'll first show you how we can you can get that data, and then some tools that we've developed to help you use it. Of course, your imagination is boundless, and if you want to use it in other ways, you are most welcome. So how do you get the data? Well, first I should say is that you can get this data and do what you want with it. We have made it all available under the license called CC0, which is a fancy way of saying no license. So public domain. CC0 means you can take this data, modify it, and sell it without quoting us. You can do what you want. It's as free as the writing of Shakespeare, or as actually any sequences which are, for example, in GeneBank. Of course, this does not mean that uh, academic norms do not apply, and we still appreciate very much if you cite us, if you need to if you use our work. But this avoids uh, what's called uh, license stacking, where you have to cite everyone who has to cite everyone who has to cite everyone, and it becomes impossible. So if you use us and you feel it's a real added value, cite us, but don't feel that this hampers your work, okay? So, the first way to get our data is to download files in which there is the data. And these files are available as TSVs, which is uh, tabulation separated files, which means you can import them easily into R, Excel, or whatever. You should know that many of our files are too big for Excel, but you can try. Uh, so we have two main types of download files, files of what we call process data and files of expression codes. The process data is levels of expression essentially, and we only provide them for FE metrics and RNA-seq, and they are in separate folders per species, and in the folder then there is a file per experiment. The expression calls, there is a file per species with the calls summarized from the data as Frederick just explained, and there are simple files where there is just the summary and advanced files where there is all the detail. We make both types of files so that the simple files are smaller, and if what you want is just to know this gene is expressed or it is not expressed in this place, you don't want all the detail, you want the file which is actually manageable on your computer. So I'm going to show you a bit in detail the content of these files, which is maybe not the most exciting slides I ever presented in my life, but it will give you an idea of what's in there. And of course, all this is entirely on our documentation on the BG website, so, and on our GitHub if you need more details. So the process data files, so here I turn them around 90 degrees so that we can actually read normally what I hear rows should be columns in the real file and then there are many rows and so what we have is for every row we'll have a combination of experiment and chip ID and a probe set ID. So on affymetrics arrays for those of you who are too young to remember it is not mapped to a gene but to a probe set which is a set of probes as its name indicates on the microarray which targets a gene and one gene can be targeted by several probe sets and they can have different signal so we separate we provide the different probe sets separately of course you also have the gene to which this is targeted so you can just decide to pass out of this the gene and then the anatomical ent entity and the stage and for which you both have the ontology code which is unique and reproducible and the name which is more human readable but might change with time and might have uh, be more ambiguous and all the other information we have the sex the strain and here the intensity which we provide the log of normalized signal intensity which is what is actually useful usually for affymetrics and we also provide in addition how this is integrated into BG, so whether we detect the present or absent, high quality, low quality, like what Frederick presented, this allows you, if needed, to go back to BG and see that your results are consistent with what we show because we give you the information we use. But primarily, what you're really going to want to need here to use is the gene, the anatomical structure, the stage, sex and strain, and the log of normalized intensity. Similarly, for RNA-seq, we provide the same type of information. So now there are no concept of probe set. And as Frederick said, we map all the different transcripts to the gene. We don't present the different transcripts as was discussed earlier. And so you have the gene ID. I don't know if we mentioned this in all these presentations, but our primary identifier for genes is always the ensemble ID. Uh, 
So if your primary identifier is something else, like Uniprot or HGNC gene names, you have to map them to ensemble IDs, but that is normally pretty easy with the tools provided by ensemble. And then we provide the read count and two normalizations, which are very commonly used, TPM, transcript per million, and FPGM, fragments per kilobase per million. TPM is the recommended one, I would say, uh, from most literature, but we want you to be free to incorporate this into your pipeline and your usual analyzers, so we provide them all, and then you can manipulate them as you want. And again, we provide the way we integrate into BG, so present, absent, level of quality, and so on. And so these files are quite big because you will have one row per combination of gene, and structure, stage, sex, and strain. So you will have, and if needed, replicates. So you will have many, many rows, but these then are the ones, the files you can use if you want to integrate into your work and uh, do differential expression, do clustering, anything you want. Now, Frédéric just presented how we call expression present absent, and this we provide you if you want to be able to use it, for example, to filter only genes expressed in a certain condition before you do present absent calls or before you look at the genes which are deregulated uh, in a disease or if you want to compare present genes between species to take only those which are common and so on. And we provide uh, simple files and advanced files and this is what the simple file looks like. It's indeed quite simple. These are the columns there are. Again, I turned it 90 degrees, so these are columns in the real file. You have a gene ID, its name, the anatomy, the development. You do not have here age, uh, sorry, sex and strain, so it's very simple. And you have whether the gene is called present or absent, with what quality, and the rank that we use the rank score that Frédéric just presented. And you have actually two versions of this file. If you want something even simpler, if you're only interested in anatomy, I only want to know what is expressed in the brain. I don't care at what age or development or stage. We actually have a version without the development. So we have for each species expression simple development, which has these two columns. And we have expression simple dot TSV, which does not have these two columns. And then you have really a file which just says for every combination gene, anatomical structure, which can be an organ, a tissue, a cell type. Is this gene present or not? And what is the rank? Very simple. And now, sometimes you want to be able to reproduce our analyzers or to filter on data type. For example, you maybe don't trust DSTs, but trust RNA-seq and so on. And so we have the advanced files, which in addition to the columns I just showed before, have all these, uh, I should have written columns here, not rows, sorry. For each, they have including observed data, yes or no, because of the propagation Frédéric showed you, we can be calling a gene present, for example, in the brain, when there was no experiment done on the brain, the only experiments done on subparts sub of the brain. So in that case, it would be no here. And if it's yes, it means there was at least one experiment actually done on this anatomical structure. So you can Trust this was studied directly. And then if there is observed data, which types for every data type, we tell you whether there was from this data type was used either by uh, propagation or directly, and whether there was directly observed in this tissue, this data type, and how much was used for present or absent of different qualities. And so this way you can sort that I only want genes which are called present with direct observation of in situ hybridization, for example. I have a question according to its blinking here. I don't know how to see it. Took. Oop. Okay, so there was a question and Frédéric answered. Okay, I continue. Uh, sorry, and so this in the complex, in the advanced file, you have this times the four data types. So you have a lot of additional rows, which then you can pass, especially if you're the kind of person who passes big files if you're by partition, whether you want to use some simple tool like grep or import it into R or program your own Python uh, function to do this, you can then find all the information, nothing is hidden. And these files, you can get them from the web page, which lends you to the FTP or directly to the FTP server if that's your religion. And so for each species, you can click and get 
the process data or you can click and see the present substance files and here you can decide I want to know the development stage and I want the advanced columns yes or no and there's always a documentation available and this is for every species so on our home page where you see all these pictures of species you click on a species and you get this option and now these files you may want directly the files to manipulate them but maybe you want to integrate this into your analysis in R and so we have made a package in R in Bioconductor called BGDB which allows you directly to query the database and obtain this data without downloading everything yourself. So I'm not going to go into great detail of this package. Those of you who registered for the hands-on this afternoon, there will be a detailed tutorial on this, but briefly what this package allows you to do is to retrieve the annotations of the RNA-seq and micro experiments which are in BG so that you can say, I want all the experiments which have uh, which are in the brain of aging adult and you can get them. I want all the experiments which have both sexes and so on uh, or RNA-seq or microarray and you can obtain the processed gene expression data. So what I showed you for Affymetrix, the logarithm of um, expression intensity and for RNA-seq counts TPMs and FPKMs and so you can write into your R code directly, find the experiments which have male brain and, and RNA-seq. With these identifiers now, go through them and get the TPMs and now use the TPMs for whatever you wanted to do downstream with male brain expression TPMs. And this will directly come into R. And there's also a function to reformat this into an expression set object, which is a type of object for those who use R, which is used in many functions which manipulate expression data so this is to make your life easier if you need and the package and its documentation available in bioconductor and this is the stable url for bioconductor which i put here on the slide and since the slides are available on the google doc you can download and copy the slide or frankly if you google bgdb package you will also find it and there's also a link from the bg page so this package allows you to easily integrate so you can make a workflow where I say I'm going to use BG to get the RNA-seq microarray that I need and then do other analyses downstream, which makes it easier than having to download everything and upload it to R and pass only the ones you want. Another way to get BG data, which I'll explain briefly because for more advanced users a priori, but I want to mention it, I don't know your level, is a Sparkle endpoint. So um, first I should say, what is a Sparkle endpoint? So Sparkle is, um, how can I explain this simply? Is a way to obtain uh, data from another database programmatically using uh, triples. So you're going to say, I want, so I have an example afterwards. I think I will show the example afterwards. Because this is a bit, I don't know to explain this simply. Okay, so those who know Sparkle, you know, that's cool. What's important to know is that our Sparkle endpoint does not query directly BG because BG is very complex, very big, and a lot of the concepts which are useful to users are in fact what is called implicit. So in the database, they're not directly, this gene is expressed in this tissue. When we make a call on the web page or on the app or on the package or on making a download file. At that point, we do all this propagation and the uh, resolution of conflicts that Frédéric showed you and give you a conclusion programmatically. So in easy BG, we have already done this so that you can have an easy database, which just tells you what you want to know, what gene is expressed in what organ at what stage, development or life stage. So it corresponds to what you see on the gene page on the web. And this EasyBG database is much smaller, easier to understand, and so it's what we suggest that people download if they want to put a local database, and it's what the Sparkle queries will query. And this will allow you to query, to make simple queries such as in which organs is a gene expressed in a given species, which genes are expressed in a given organ in a given species, which genes are expressed in a given organ and development stage or in a given development stage and so on. And 
there is the, this is the URL of the Sparkle endpoint. We have a documentation, <coughs> sorry, with examples. And we are also part of a project called Biosoda, which allows you to combine Sparkle queries across different databases so that you can query both BG and say Uniprot and say, I want the genes which are expressed in the liver and have an annotation to being involved in liver diseases. And so what Sparkle uh, query looks like uh, briefly is something like this, where what is important is that here you see that I'm saying that I want to recover, uh, uh, where is it written? I filter, I want only genes which have this gene name and I want to recover their anatomical entities. And so I'm going to get the anatomical entities where this, the gene with this name is expressed and I restrict it to a certain species from the taxonomy identifier, so the RET. So the RET, where are RET APOC1 genes expressed in which anatomical structures? And what's good with such a query is that when BG updates, it will update the results automatically. You can easily integrate it with other such queries. Now all this was about recovering the data. Now I'm going to show you some of the tools that we've built on top of BG, which allow you to take advantage of our structured data to get some biological knowledge. Sorry. And the first of these is Top Anat. So Top Anat is very similar to a gene ontology enrichment. So I suppose most of you have already done a gene ontology enrichment. The principle is you get a gene list from some experiment, or the genes are conserved between two species, or the genes are duplicated, or the genes are differentially expressed between the treatment and no treatment, whatever. And you want to make sense of this gene list, and you're not going to read all the papers about thousands of genes. So instead, you pop paste that gene list into a gene ontology enrichment tool, and it tells you, hey, that gene list is enriched in kinases, and so that's interesting about signal transfer. And how this works is that it compares using a, a contingency table and a Fisher exact test. You would have your gene list and the universe of other genes and whether the genes are annotated to a certain term or not in the gene ontology and whether the frequency is different than what's expected by chance. So if say 5% of all the genome is kinases, but in my list 20% of the genes are kinases, that's more than expected by chance. So I'll say it's enriched in kinases. And these gene ontology terms, as I said earlier this morning, they're annotated to the genes through either automatic or manual annotation. Now we can do exactly the same because instead of the gene ontology, we have another ontology, but it's the same structure computationally, which is Eubron, which is the anatomy. And we have also association between the terms of the ontology and the genes. Instead of being like in the gene ontology association between a gene ontology term and a gene, we have association between an anatomical term and a gene, and this association is through gene expression. So if a gene APOC1 is expressed in the liver, then the gene APOC1 has an association to the anatomical term liver. So now I can build for each anatomical structure of the ontology. I can build a table where I have the genes from my gene list of interest, say genes which have uh, duplications in human and or genes which are involved in autism or anything. I have my gene list and I look are they expressed in this structure, for example, the liver, there are a certain number expressed, a certain number not expressed, and all the universe of genes possible, a certain number expressed or not expressed. And I can do a Fisher test or a hypogeometric test, usually a Fisher test, in our case, to see if I have an excess or a deficit of genes from my list which are expressed in this structure. This is very similar in principle to a gene ontology enrichment test. One difference is that we only use experimental data for these genes and this species. So if you do the test on mouse or in rat, in mouse will only use gene expression data experimentally derived in mouse, and in rat will only use gene expression data experimentally derived in rat. When you do a gene ontology enrichment test, 
most of the annotations have been transferred by autology between species. So you don't actually know that this function really exists in the rat, say. Whereas here, we know this gene expression really exists in the species. And we also have a deconvolution of the ontology graph. I will explain this a bit in the next slide. But basically, we use uh, our package, which does gene ontology enrichment, called TOPGO, and we modified its code to be adapted to the ontology of anatomy, which allows us to use all the same statistical tools because it is, in fact, quite similar. It's the same mathematical object, the ontology, and so we can manipulate it the same way. And so this looks like this. Here I have an example where I put, uh, I took the genes which have uh, a phenotype which has been annotated in the database. So the database of the zebrafish model organism is Zfin. We took all the genes where there is a phenotype known when you mutate this gene, you have a phenotype in the pectoral fin. We put these genes here on the top and at web page of the BG website. And I get here, these are anatomical structures where these genes are expressed. And I have seven times, 7.4 times more genes expressed in the pectoral fin than I would expect if I'd put, there's, 100, there's 98 genes here. These 98 genes, if I'd sampled them randomly in the genome, I would have seven times less expected pectoral fin. And this is very significant. We provide a p-value and an FDR from the test. So this means that I have a very strong enrichment that genes which have a phenotype when they're mutated, a phenotype in the pectoral fin, are expressed in the pectoral fin, which is not in itself a very biologically surprising result, but that allows us to check that the method works. And I see that I have several questions. I'll interrupt for a second to see those questions. So someone asked, why TPM is recommended? I'll come back to this at the end, I think. Okay. Um, and here you see that there are several, many, several options on the website. One option here is that the background here was by default all the genes for which we have data in BG for zebrafish. You can change this and put custom data. Why is this important? Because if I have a data set which I filtered for various reasons, then this can bias my set and I should compare only to what I can reasonably expect. I'll give you an example. If I look at genes which are, um, which uh, duplicate specifically in primates relative to other mammals, I could only do that analysis for genes for which I had autologs between primates and other mammals. And so my background should be the genes for which I have autologs between primates and other mammals. It should not be the genes for which I could not decide whether they were duplicated or not. If I take genes which have a certain um, protein function, this is only possible for protein coding genes. So my background should be protein coding genes, etc. Sorry, Mark. Yes. Uh, you get a question about uh, the enrichment test. Uh, how can I find out what level of Go is mostly meaningful to describe my data? Uh, the go. Uh, so this is not private. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, so so the meaningful cut have to be not the broad and not restricted. That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. So I have a forty-five minute uh, lecture on the go, <laughs> which is this is not. Um, but let's say briefly. So if I go to this part here, decorrelation. So a problem with ontology and enrichment tests, whether it's gene ontology or anatomy, Uberon, is that. There's a lot of redundancy because a gene which is, say, if I have a gene list which tends to be more expressed in the cerebellum than by chance, it would also tend to be more expressed in the brain than by chance and in the nervous system than by chance. But this is actually the same information several times. So if you say no decorrelation here, this will give you what most uh, enrichment packages give you, treating every different term as independent, although they are not. And so here there are three decorrelation algorithms which come from this package called TopGo. So they explain in the TopGo papers. Elim is the simplest to understand. Elim, as its name indicates, eliminates. So if I have, for example, a significant uh, enrichment of expression here in the pectoral fin, then all the genes here which are annotated to the pectoral fin will not be used at all to study other structures that might be parents. So for example, fin or paired limb, and so on. So 
anything which gives me a significant signal and a precise structure would not be used further up. The result of this is that this algorithm will give you only almost precise structures, unless there are genes which are specifically called expressed only in broad structures. Most of the signal will be in the precise structure and that's all you will get. So in that case, it will bias your result, not in a bad way, okay, it's a correct result, towards precise structures, which is something you sometimes want. Conversely, you can use a parent child, which will bias towards the broad structure. It will first tell you what are the broad structures, where there's overrepresentation, and not give you the subparts. So in that case, it would tend to tell you something like limbs or something like that, or maybe even something broader. And weight is in between. I like it. That's why I took it here. It's going to give. Uh, it's going to give you in priority the more precise structures, but it's not going to totally remove their information looking at the more broad structures. It's just going to downweigh it. So the more information gene brought to a precise structure, the less information will be allowed to give to the broader structure, which is its parent in the ontology graph, but it is still taken into account a bit. So we don't totally lose this information. And that's what I used here. So. I don't think it's a good idea to give one cutoff in an ontology because the ontology are not built like this. They will have more or less levels of uh, granularity and detail in different parts of the graph because of the, A, the quantity of knowledge we have at the time it was captured, which is always evolving because biology is a changing science, and also because simply some structures are more complicated to describe than others, so there'd be more terms. So you see sometimes some tools for gene ontology will say we can cut at level four or something, but level four means nothing. Sometimes it will be a very precise term, sometimes a very detailed term. So I think it's better to use algorithms like this, which either start from the parents or start from the leaves, and usually we're interested in the precise terms, so we'll start from the leaves, from the precise terms, and go up, emphasizing the leaves. So that would be my recommendation, not to put a hard cutoff, but to use an algorithm such as provided in TopGo, and here top and at, which will weigh differently the information from the precise terms and the broad terms. And usually in my experience, we want information from the precise terms, but sometimes we want from the very broad terms, and then you can use that algorithm. For the details of how to use this on gene ontology, I would send you to the TopGo paper, which we can put a link in the, in the uh, Google Doc. Hope this answers. Um, other options we have here, we can choose to look, we, we give you the results separately for the embryo and the post-embryo because we consider the expression in say, uh, embryonic brain and post-embryonic brain are not necessarily the same structure, don't have the same meaning. And you can separate by uh, expression data type or use them all together. And this, I should emphasize, works, it's only based on our cause of present absent. And so the fact that it works very well, and we've made many tests since we have this, and it usually works well, as in this example, but we've tried quite a few, it shows that our calls work well, because when we make the calls, we can never be 100% sure of what we do, obviously, and we know we make some mistakes because that's life, but how reliable is it? Well, here we have a tool which constructs a whole complicated thing based on these calls, and it works. We get the biology out. When you put the gene list, say we've made various tests of sanity, you take genes which are, have the gene ontology term spermatogenesis, and you get the testis and the spermatocytes. You put the genes which are involved in autism, and you get the parts of the brain which are involved in autism, and so on and so forth. So it works really well. Uh, so I start to speak a bit about this already, but top and at analyzers have the same pitfalls, the same things you should be very careful about as gene ontology enrichment tests. And one which is really important, I cannot emphasize this enough, is the background. If you use the wrong background, you'll get the wrong conclusions. Because if, for example, for example, there is a lot of gene ontology annotations done to in uh, human and mouse to ovary and breast, and so genes which are involved in uh, sexual differences have a lot of annotations to this, even if they are male specific. So you have to put the background that I want the genes. If you have a subset of gene ontology as your test, you want the background has some gene ontology enrichment. If you have a subset of protein coding genes, you want the background protein coding genes and so on. You have to be very careful about this or it can completely change your results in a wrong way.
You should think basically of all the steps in your pipeline to generate your data and the step you're testing. If you're testing this step, your background should be the data at the step just before. Another pitfall I just mentioned is the non-independence so that there are algorithms which allow you to deconvolute the graph. So to take into account in simple terms, this non-independence. And of course there's multiple testing. There are tens of thousands of gene ontology terms, tens of thousands of anatomy terms, thousands which are used in BG. And you do all these Fisher exact tests or hypogeometric tests term by term. So you have a huge problem of tests of multiple testing. And so some people want to take it into account and some not. There is a philosophical debate in the field. So we give you a choice. We provide you the uncorrected p-value and the FDR, but it's something to be always aware of at least. And I should emphasize these are not specific pitfalls of top and up, but pitfalls of any uh, ontology enrichment test. And Topanat, I showed you on the web, but it's also in the BGDB package. And on the BGDB package, there are more options. So for example, if you want to run uh, an anatomical enrichment test to a very specific age or stage of development, you can, which you cannot on the web page, for example. And you can include it in your pipeline so that, for example, you do various analyses and do the gene ontology enrichment and the anatomy enrichment as a step of your analysis to see how to interpret your results and what they make sense. So I see that I'm running late on time. So I will try to go not too slowly. We told you this morning that we annotate anatomical homology. We make this available to you in two ways. The first way is simply a web page where you can paste Uberon IDs for one species and it tells you what is the homology with other species? So for example, here, I took the Uberon IDs of all the human tissues which are in the GTEC big data set. And I asked for human and zebrafish. So I have here, what is the homology between these tissues and zebrafish? And you see some have a direct easy homology. Hypothalamus exists in both zebrafish and human, it's homologous at the caudate level. Caudate is the group which includes vertebrates and others. And some are a bit more complicated. For example, heart left ventricle in, uh, is homologous to primary heart field. And these are the 31 which have a homology and there's also all the others which do not have any homology from the Evo Devo and paleontological literature between human and zebrafish. So this means that if you want to compare GTEC data to zebrafish data, say because you have uh, phenotypes in zebrafish you want to use to interpret the data, you can only interpret for these 31 tissues. So you have this information. Right now you have to paste the Uberon IDs. So to find this Uberon IDs, you should go to the Uberon webpage. There's a link here put the name and you get the idea and paste it. And another way we use homology is to compare gene expression between species. So say you have a list of autologous genes in species and you want to see do they have conserved expression and how high is this expression? Well, you want to compare the expression of the autologous genes between the homologous organs. And so this is what we provide you here in the expression comparison tool. You paste here your list of, here it's autologous genes. It's all autologs of SRM4, which is a gene which is known in uh, several mammals to be in brain specific. And here we see that I have the expression conservation. So I have of the 13 genes I gave, the 13 are all expressed in the brain with high scores in the 13 species. And if I would, here it's a screenshot, so I cannot do this, but on the real website, I could unfold and see the detail of every gene. See that they're also all expressed in central nervous system. In four brain, I have 10 out of 13, which I expressed, three which have no data, and I have none which have no expression, absence of expression. And if I go down the list, then I could sort it different ways, clicking on these columns. I could say I want to see in priority the places where they don't have expression and so on. And so this concludes the presentations of this morning. I see that I already have several questions, so I'll go uh, soon to the question, a new one appeared, magic. So the aim of BG is really to make gene expression useful by pro pro uh, providing our expertise. So we spend a lot of time trying to 
understand what are the best methods, what are the best data, what are the best ways to treat them. When there is something from the literature, we use it. When there is not something, we invent it and benchmark it. And the idea is to make this step easy for you. We provide you the cause and you can trust them because we did all the work before. We provide you the curated data and you can trust it. We provide you the enrichment and you can trust it. Of course, as Ronald Reagan famously said, trust but verify. That's why all our code and our data are open and available. But really our aim is to make things easier for you because what you want to do is the analysis which are downstream from this. So thank you for your attention.